All right. Happy Monday, everybody. Uh, glad to see a, a good turnout to this kind of the first webinar uh, where we talk about gaming and the effects on our professional lives. Um, I'm your facilitator, Joshua Rao. I work for Walmart. I'm a product manager for Games for Learning. Um, I have a background in technology and before that also game design and game development on tabletop and the tabletop world, um, as well as uh, more recently starting to work with the therapeutic gaming community. Um, and I uh, do want to thank uh, kind of Brad and the CEA for uh, putting this all together for letting a lot of us who, um, honestly, I'm used to seeing handles and and chat. And so uh, I know there's a couple of folks that this is the first time I'm actually getting to see your faces. So it's, uh, it's, it's cool for me anyways, to be here facilitating this. Um, so uh, that's kind of enough about me. I will, uh, let's do some quick introductions. Uh, Neil, if you want to introduce yourself first, please. Yeah, my name is Neil Patel. I'm a principal product manager with Amazon. Um, I've been there for about uh, close to five years, uh, working in a group called Grand Challenge, which is a research and development wing of Amazon. Before that, I worked for Google uh, with a group called Advanced Technology and Projects, also research and development. Um, when I'm playing Overwatch, they call me Marauder Shields. Awesome. Um, Elon. Yeah, hi everyone. So I'm Elon Liu, a software engineer at Microsoft for just a bit more than two years. I previously graduated from Polytechnic Montreal with a degree, a degree in software engineering and then joined Microsoft as a new grad. Um, I'm also the founder of the Corporate Esports at Microsoft program, which has been around for the past year and a half. Um, so our goals with this is really to improve culture and employee morale by giving employees incentive to involve Microsoft in their extracurricular activities, improve employee camaraderie by having employees practice together and strive towards a common goal, and give opportunities of networking through gaming as a medium. Um, so I'm pretty sure that during this webinar, I will have more instances to really talk about um, this initiative and how much it has really helped uh, Microsoft employees. Um, also, yeah, you, you, know, you can also know, um, tell, talk to me through the gamer, the gamer handle of Mali, and just basically just my name backwards. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And, uh, Michael or Death Knight. <laughs> yeah, I go by either. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Flores. My handle on most games is Death9-9911. The League of Legends is my primary game of choice. Currently, I work at IBM as the client technical leader for the Departments of Justice, State, and the U.S. Agency for International Aid. Um, I've been at IBM for about 10 years, and for most of those years, I've been focused on figuring out how to apply technology to address the strategic needs of various organizations within the federal government. So everything from the initial discussion of how technology can be shaped to address industry needs down to uh, architecture design and development and actual um, hands-on implementation. So I'm grateful that at IBM, there's roles like this one that allow me to do all of it. So get to do a lot of interesting things, some of which you can talk about, some of which you can't, um, but all you know, interesting problems with great technology. And for the last eight of those you know, nine years I've been at IBM, I've served as our founder and lead of IBM's gaming community. And, and much like the previous speaker mentioned, you know, there's a lot of benefit to organizations like ours for our community. And, and I look forward through this panel of sharing more of that. Uh, the best thing that I'm most proud of that I want to offer is that you know, we've seen our community grow from a handful of folks playing a couple of games now to around 13, 1,400 people congregating around gaming around the world. So it really is something wonderful to behold. Awesome. And I totally skipped out on the actual gaming portion. Uh, so my handle is Penguin. Uh, almost everywhere I go, depending upon what I play, I go by a lot of other character names. Um, usually I'm playing Smash Brothers and I'm just called, I thought he said he was a Lucas main, um, since I haven't played Lucas in multiple iterations, but I still claim it because, you know, you can't prove I'm bad if I never play him. So, um, 
I, I want to start off. So we, we went around with this games taught me moments. So the big thing, uh, the big thing about everybody here is that games have, have done more than just been a pastime. Right. And so, um, Michael, do you mind sharing with us what your diving into your games taught me moment? Certainly. So uh, to preface, I need I need to give everyone an understanding of how gaming has been a part of my life. Um, by the time I was born, I was the youngest kid. I've got one older brother, about three years older. Uh, my parents already had, uh, I think it was an Atari 3600. So when I was, as soon as I was old enough to hold on to a controller and pay attention, as soon as object permanence set in, I was usually seated next to my dad and my brother watching them play these games. Now, looking back on these Atari games, I realized as a young kid, you have no clue what these games are about. Um, but as I reflect on the kind of experiences I've had with gaming throughout my, throughout my life, I realized that over and over again, gaming has offered ample opportunity to learn new things. And specifically, the lessons that I find myself learning through gaming have been around leadership. So, you know, when, uh, when World of Warcraft came out, I was a big World of Warcraft fan. Um, I was huge into the Warcraft world, primarily because of the game that would later become League of Legends. So when WoW came out, I was in on the beta. I was one of those guys there. And when WoW actually released, I was probably one of the first five guilds on my server, on Horde. I think the server was Azjal Narug. And I thought, cool, guild makes sense. I started it up. And as like a 13, 14 year old, I had no clue about the leadership implications of actually being a guild master. And, you know, I met some people, had a core group going, folks were leveling. And I remember this like it was yesterday. I got bored of World of Warcraft and I just went AFK for like a whole month. And it was very interesting to me that I come back a month later and everyone, all but one person has left the guild. And this was the first of many instances where I had a reflection on what happened, talked to some of the other folks in the guild who were people probably, you know, older than me, and got some feedback about how leaving your guild right after you form it with no awareness is not a really cool leadership thing to do. But me as a 12, 13-year-old kid, I was a heck of a rogue, had no clue about the implications of running a guild. I fast forward to time spent organizing my gaming community, organizing, um, you know, leading teams for games like League of Legends, and I had similar opportunities in front of me about leadership. Where I've learned through some of the great feedback from some of my mentors that even in the context of gaming, there is real leadership principles that you are applying. And even though we're used to gaming being a context where we have fun, maybe you know, loosen our collars, let our hair down, um, we're still showcasing who we are as a leader in that context. And I've learned a lot of challenging but really powerful lessons through gaming around how, how to be a fair leader, how to be a principled leader how to be consistent, even if the consistency maybe costs the team a win, if you know you guarantee that everyone would get to play in your team based on a predefined schedule. And it's kind of blown my mind, the kind of things I've been able to learn through running these communities, facilitating teams, that when I go back to my day job, um, I get really interesting sorts of feedback about the sort of leadership skills I'm exhibiting, even though my day job doesn't require any of those. But through organizing teams, better experiences running guilds um, and organizing this community, I've been able to learn what it means to be a leader. And it's not something that someone blesses you, right? You don't get a role that says you manage a team, but it's a mindset and a way you run projects, a way you treat other people. And, and to me, without gaming, it's hard to think about where I would have learned that. But it's exciting to see that through gaming, through communities like ours, anyone and everyone has that opportunity. And I think that's going to be one of the big force multipliers for many of our respective communities is the leadership experiences that folks can have through gaming, whether they're captaining a team, whether they're playing on a team at a competitive level, or whether they're helping organize communities like ours and uh, events and organizations like the Corporate Esports Association. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. And uh, I love uh, you brought up WoW, and WoW is one of those things that I have always included on my resume as a guildmaster slash raid leader. Uh, and I encourage everybody else that if you're leading teams, like throw that onto your resume. If anything else, it gets you to uh, to ask really fun questions uh, in interviews. So, um, Neil, why don't you tell us about your uh, gaming taught me moment? Yeah, sure. Uh, can we do the screen share thing? Yeah, for sure. Let me get. Oh, 
Right. Uh, can everybody see the, uh, is that what you're expecting to see? Yes, that's what okay. we should be looking at. Yeah. Can everyone see this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. All right, cool. So mine's a little bit more presentation style. Apologize for that, but I have just so much to say and you can't shut me up. Um, uh, Josh will try. Um, anyway, thanks everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, my gaming Tommy moment really comes from the perspective of being a manager and being responsible for like 80 plus software developers. And when I look at a picture like this, this is from the George Floyd protests around June of this year. Um, I not only see a society in transformation, but I also see my employees and I see some of us on this call. And we are all in the process of dealing with a very stressful reassessment um, of uh, both our society as well as who we are as people. And one of my challenges as a manager is how I show up for my employees, not just in terms of helping them improve their performance, but also in the context of their mental health and where they're at right now and how we create organizations within our company that help people to feel safe and express themselves, but also move their careers forward. Now we have some tools um, that allow us to do things like that. For example, we have nonviolent communication. We have, I don't know why this, presentation is not advancing. Is it? Okay. Be because I was waiting for click or assign to move it forward. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, should I click or? Uh... I, you can't click. It's going to be me unless you want to screen share yourself. Oh, I should be screen sharing right now myself. Unless you're doing it. I'm doing it. Oh, I'm using yeah. yours. Okay. All right. So then I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you when to click over. Um, so I guess my, my, my fundamental question to all of us is when we're dealing with our teams and in the situation as managers, how are we preparing our people to work well with others under psychological stress? I, actually, would it be okay if I just- you're, You are you are now in control. You're okay, good to, all right. you're in control, yeah. Awesome, okay. So we all see this question. We have some tools that we use in order to deal with this. We have things like nonviolent communication, we have anti-racism training. We also have traditional tools like L&D and coaching. Now, one of the problems with these tools is that if you really want to engage, and I've tried this by hiring folks to come and talk to my teams, this is emotional work. Um, and it requires us to sit down and really practice it every day. If you want to practice embodied anti-racism in your team, if you want to practice nonviolent communication, you have to train people. And if you don't get senior leadership involved up front, these activities begin to seem insurgent or even rebellious to leadership and they tend to breed resentment. And so we have this problem that the work we wanna to do to take care of our teams, show up for our teams and develop them kind of trades off with the workplaces that we're in. It also trades off with how we look at performance. It trades off with how we identify what's valuable about the people that we wanna promote or develop. And we tend to use words like visibility name recognition, having high impact or showing executive presence. And we know now after working to dismantle some institutions in our society, that these terms are problematic, right? These are terms that work well for some types of people, but not others. And it is perfectly possible for someone to contribute at work, to enable others, uh, but not have a lot of visibility, not have what's perceived as high impact or executive presence because they don't conform to our expectations of what those things might be. And so we don't have anything to do for them. Now, if these words seemed like the kind of words that only work for you if you're you know, um, well-recognized or successful, let's consider who frames them for a minute. These are all terms that you probably would apply to a, a heterosexual white male. Um, they're not terms that would apply to a lot of the folks on this call in terms of how we're noticed at work. And as a result, we lose out understanding the performance of people like this. So this is Shane Battier. He's a basketball player from the Miami Heat. Um, he's a really great player, but his stats don't actually look awesome. When you look at Shane Battier, he looks like an average player. When you put him on the court with every other player, a very weird thing happens. That's one of the reasons why the Heat was so good back in the day. Uh, Shane makes everybody else play better. It's a documented statistical fact. We call it the Shane Battier effect. And the problem we have is that we don't know how to measure the effectiveness of someone like Shane Battier with a universe that works with 
terms like visibility, name recognition, high impact, executive presence as some of the only things that we care about when we develop people. Now, how did we get there and how can gaming actually help us? Well, we don't come by these terms by accident. We have a lot of psychology and systems that we use to define an individual talent at work. Uh, we have lots of terms like openness and agreeableness, introversion, extroversion. And we have a vision of these as a picture of how a person performs and what we can expect from them. The problem is that this is all relying on the idea that these individual personality traits are a snapshot in time. And so when we develop people, we don't know what to do when a person changes or when their situation changes. For example, when they're not working as an individual under normal circumstances, but under stress. We have a concept of a thing called a shadow personality, where some of the more quote unquote negative parts of our personality come out on stress. Exactly, it's big five stuff, right? And we know that when we're stressed, that picture changes a lot. So we have analytics. We try to predict when a person might leave work, for example, or whether a person will be successful during pallet review um, based upon the types of attributes that we see uh, in this person's psychology. Now, what happens when this person joins a team? What happens when they operate under pressure on a team? Well, we have some tools from social network analysis. We can tell if people influence one another's feelings, kind of. We can tell who is influential and who isn't. But again, this just goes back to that same group of adjectives, who is visible, who has high impact. We miss out on the Shane values. So this leaves us with three problems. People are different around other people. Their personalities change. People are different when they're under pressure and stress. People act differently under pressure. And the thing about work is it brings all these things together. And what we don't have is a way to actually train people to understand who they are as individuals, who they are under stress, and who they are in a work situation with a team. So obviously my answer to all of these questions, how do we do this work at scale? How do we effectively manage people? How do we recognize their talents under stress and with teams? And how do we reward people who work well on a team because they don't show up and our talent management apparatus? Well, the answer to me is video games. Now I've used video games before to teach people back at Google, Nick knows this. We taught people systems thinking with the video game portal. Why? Because it's way easier for me to have you just play the first four levels of portal to describe what system thinking is and for you to experience it and hold on to that and use it as a tool in your job. But one of the cool things I've noticed about video games is that you can take a bunch of employees and you can have them play a video game. And one of the first things you notice is that when they play as a team, they are all under stress and they all have to cooperate in order to win. What's interesting is that if we can use technology to understand how they're communicating in the video game and the decisions they make and how they manage their teams and their peers to achieve a goal, we have an insight into their personality and how it changes when they're working with a team. In fact, we can look at the personality of an entire team. This is a screenshot from a tool that the EA uses to understand how teams work together. So these individuals, when they communicate, they produce uh, data that allows us to understand a little bit about how they communicate and their personality in that situation. So in this case, for example, Gravitas would be, I'm the person who takes charge, directs everybody, um, who communicates a lot. Participation and clarity is more that I'm the person who's, I understand the goal. I try to help folks achieve it. Attentiveness is I take care of other people. I'm more of a support player. And we can measure all this from the way that we talk in video games. What that also means though, is that the training that we have to do, that's just get an employee to play a video game and learn about how they communicate in real time. And then use that information to communicate differently in the next video game and in the next one. And in the end, we not only learn who we are in terms of how we communicate, that's the dark circle here, but also who we are under stress and who we are when our team needs us. Here's an individual who tends to be, uh, you know, relatively attentive to others, but when pressure comes and they have to be a leader, they drive up gravitas, they take in charge, they, they talk to people. This is an incredibly powerful insight that we can get every time we play a video game with people. Effectively, every video game session we have is a 90 minute experiment where we can learn about how we communicate, collect data on it and improve for the next time that we play. And all an employee has to do is just show up and play the video game, which are designed to be fun, 
which are designed to be engaging. And that's something that the uh, video game maker has taken care of. Where does that leave us? Well, if I look at someone like Shane Battier through the lens of a video game, it's a person with high clarity, high attentiveness, and low gravitas. It means they're not going to show up with big wins or impact or visibility or all the things that we roll our eyes about when we hear them in promotion or the things that we scramble to prove that we've done while we spent the most of our career just helping other people and trying to get work done and cooperating. Instead, if we understand Shane Battier, the way that he works, we can be looking at more positive definitions that capture what value that Shane brings to the team. Shane's a force multiplier. Shane enables others and owns execution. With data, we can bring these different ways of participating to the surface. And we can also improve on how we communicate using these different ways of participating. We can create talent management and talent development for all members of our team while they're in teams without actually forcing people into one narrative that only works for one type of person. So with that, I wanna leave you with these two quick uh, snapshots. Um, this is what I wanna do with my team. I want them to go through this process, learn how they flex as a team, learn what types of people they are under pressure and learn what they can do to improve. And we can do it easily and simply by having fun and playing video games. Um, so that's it for me. That's my main point there. So yeah, thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And the great thing about this, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, is is also when we talk about games and the impact is how do we measure that in a professional world? Um, but we'll talk about that more later. Uh, I want to get to to Elon and what is it, what is it that your what are your gaming games taught me moments? What what's the big things for you? Um yeah, so definitely um I have a Mainly two points, I think, uh, two lessons I've really learned from gaming. So the first one is really from high school onwards. Um, I've been competing in local tournaments, um, a lot of esports tournaments, mainly in the games of League of Legends and Overwatch. Um, I also had joined my university's college Overwatch team and played there for maybe two or three seasons. Um, definitely, I think playing in such a competitive environment, I've really learned on how important team dynamic is and fostering an environment where people can grow and feel valued. Um, I've had quite a few instances where, you know, this is, you, you are in a team situation where you're really striving towards a common goal, which is, you know, winning and really trying to really align everybody to really um, play together in a better fashion than if you were to play individually. Um, of course, um, there were situations where players weren't on the same page or the pressure would really bring out the worst in individuals. Um, you also meet so many different personalities when playing in teams and right off the bat, maybe if somebody might seem quite chill, um, being in such a high pressure environment in the end makes them um, makes them act in a different manner from how they usually are. And I think Neil has kind of touched on that. And I think that's really interesting. Um, so I definitely feel like after being in so many different environments and really meeting so many different personalities, um, I can definitely say that I feel like I've really sharpened my hunch for picking up on negative emotions such as distress and discomfort and just playing in so many different teams and really interacting with different people. Um, I definitely feel like I've had um, a lot of opportunities to improve my pacification skills and really being able to reach out to people. And I think being able to learn how to deal with people who are in emotional distress is very important. And this is something I definitely think I have brought along with me in, into other areas in my life, especially at work, for example. Um, work is kind of the same, not not as like intense as if you're playing like a game of League of Legends where, you know, there's like a big price pool, but I think it's somewhat similar, right? Because everybody is really just trying to work and do their best um, so they can actually go up the ladder or, you know, at least do like some type of good performance. Um, yeah, so I definitely feel like what I've learned from playing in high environments um, high pressure environments with gaming, I've really been able to bring that along into the work environment. And with that, I'm able to really pick up when, you know, sometimes I might 
because maybe me or like another person might say something um, that might ruffle the feathers of someone else. But because I've been able to really see so many different environments um, with gaming, with that, I'm really able to, you know, I can sense when someone is really ruffled or really irritated. And after that, I'm able to really go talk to them one on one and really try to settle things down and really make and hopefully um, help for a better team environment. Because I think that's really, for me personally, I think um, a team environment, a work environment where I feel like I can talk to other people and everybody can say their piece. I think that's the most important part for me. Um, another thing I've really learned from gaming is really it's power to form strong relationships as a bridge. Um, so I've been playing ever since I was four years old with um, Pokemon Yellow being my very first game. Um, it's still one of my favorite games but that might be nostalgia, but also a big Pokemon fan. Um, yeah, so video games has played an immense part of, in my life. I honestly cannot recall a time when I was not playing video games. Um, maybe I'm, I'm addicted, but whatever. <laughs> a lot of my friendships have really evolved from playing together and connecting um, over video games, whether it's by discussing over some epic moments while trying to beat a boss or, you know, really actually playing co-op games such as Overcooked. Um, yeah, so for me, connecting through gaming is such an important part of my life. Um, that's why I really created the Corporate Esports on Microsoft initiative. Um, so as a college graduate, I arrived at Microsoft with the thought of, you know, oh my God, no, I won't be able to play um, or participate in esports um, or have any more gaming opportunities. But actually with the Corporate Esports Association seasons, I can actually still participate in a team and at the same time represent um, the company that I'm working for, which is so amazing. I actually was so happy to learn that it was something like this. Um, yeah, then, and actually as a new grad coming into Microsoft, I realized that honestly, there were not, there were gaming uh, communities at Microsoft, but they were not really out there to display. You really had to go and search into all of these like obscure distribution lists if you really wanted to. And sometimes there weren't even any communities. So that's why I created a corporate esports at Microsoft initiative where we really support our Microsoft esports teams. We organize various gaming tournaments and provide a space for employees to get to know each other in a context closer to gaming than just work. And honestly, I've seen a lot of friendships and sometimes even romance um, blossom from the opportunity that, that we have created at the initiative. And personally, some of the people I talk to are, are still like fellow employees that I met through either CA or through some of the tournaments. So I definitely think gaming is such a good medium and it's so important to be able to use it um, to really connect people. Um, so, and sometimes I kind of wonder you know, at some events, um, at local events that we have in Microsoft, sometimes we go we go bowling, for example, or you know, we would have like karaoke sessions with um, with the team. But why can't we just bring gaming right into the picture, especially um, in these current circumstances where social distancing is very important? So yeah, I think we've talked a lot, but yeah, definitely the main two things I really learned from gaming. That's awesome. No, that sense of community, and you you touched on uh, you touched on one of the things about like in the past year and a half, in the past seventeen months, uh, it seems like these sort of gaming communities have started to bring things in. Uh, I don't know about the rest of y'all. I'm sure you're probably in a similar case where you have random people that will ping you that'll that'll uh, send you a message or an email and just say, hey. I, my team needs something to do together that's remote. Can you help? Uh, and I really feel like, I just really want to emphasize, uh, Elon, what you said there. It's like that community of games brings people together, um, competitive or not. Um, and that'll lead us into one of the first questions that we had from, uh, is around, uh, how do we find, uh, how do you find a common game of choice uh, or let other people play catch up? Um, and then as kind of a follow-up to that, what do you do about dejected feelings that grow if people are excluded because you're not playing their game? 
I, I could take that one. Uh, two things first is that um, for the benefit of folks who don't actually uh, play tons of video games, I think we should disambiguate things like guilds and raids for a second so that people have context. So just really quickly, like if you're playing a game that requires you to play with other people, finding other people is kind of the first step to enjoying that game. And if you go out into the world and just play with strangers, it's like walking into a bus station and saying, who wants to play game poker? Um, any weirdo will walk up, right? And it could be disastrous. Um, so what gamers have naturally done over the last five, six years is they've formed their own communities that start small, just people playing. And then they do the organizational work that Elon and Michael were talking about, which is they go out and find people, they recruit people, they run it as an organization, they care about retention, um, they organize events and they all go play together. And everyone's motivated to do that because you need other people to play. Um, so there's an intrinsic reciprocity in video games uh, that you depend on your teammates to play and for excellence, they depend on you. So we have to keep these community togethers, communities together just to be able to play, which trains a lot of us in the communication skills required to keep a group of people together. So within that context, when we talk about games, like when we talk about a very complicated or difficult game like Overwatch, right, or whatever, it requires lots of mechanical skill. It requires strategy, placement, mastery of different techniques, yada, yada, yada. People put tons of hours into perfecting Overwatch, like being good at basketball or football or any other type of sport. Some games like Among Us don't really require that. They require us to run around and have fun and just be very uh, suspicious of the person who was last alone in that hallway. Um, so um, there are games, the, the beauty of games is that developers realize not everyone likes to play a game like Overwatch or League of Legends. Some people like games like Among Us or Mario Kart or Smash Brothers. Not that Smash Brothers isn't like an alpha game, it totally is. Um, the, the, the point is that games that are more accessible to people are actually quite popular. Elon mentioned Overcooked. It's a game literally about trying to cook a bunch of food in a restaurant and all the things that go with that. And it's hilarious. Um, so the beauty of this approach is that there's a group game out there for everybody. Um, and they're designed to be easy to pick up and play, which is why so many people do it. So, so I, I'd like to add to that a bit, Josh, as far as um, how we go about choosing games. Um, as, as Neil uh, articulated very well, you've got some specialist games. And, you know, if you play any of those games, you know the level of investment. That stuff can be intimidating to newcomers. For those sorts of games, we usually have established communities. I encourage my communities, especially the larger ones and specialist games like that, to create easy on-ramps for people who are curious about League of Legends. And uh, just tonight, we've got an intern who's leaving IBM Friday. He's a grandmaster in League of Legends, giving a workshop on his top 10 tricks for climbing in League of Legends. So we try to encourage our experts within the specialist communities to present and provide you know, insider access to others who are curious. Separate from those complex games that we try to make more accessible through boot camps, sessions, workshops, and social nights, um, we look for games that are um, accessible across platforms and accessible across regions. And right now, there's a couple that I'm really fond of. The first one that I like, Super Bomberman R Online. This game, easy to pick up, classic Bomberman. It's completely cross-platform. So you can get it on PC, any of the consoles this generation or last, and it's free to play with the caveat that a single player has to pay a $10 DLC to host a private lobby, which can host up to 64 players. And because it's cross-platform, because it's cross-region, because the cost is zero, you know, we're able to make a call two weeks in advance and get IBMers from across multiple continents to show up to play Bomberman. And because it's such a light game to pick up, right, easy to play, hard to master, um, we can get folks who haven't played a Bomberman game in their entire life, and within a few rounds, they're having a great time. And so we look to games that are more accessible, either on the basis of cost or platform, or you know, are games that someone can pick up without having to have that deep subject matter expertise. And again, with our communities of passionate experts, whether they be grandmasters or lifelong fans of the genre, we take advantage of that expertise to create on ramps for new players, and in that way, you know, bring people together. Whether we pick an a game that's easier to pick up, or whether we have our experts, our specialists, provide an on-ramp and an insider view into that game. 
One thing I might quickly quickly add as an uh, two th two quick points to quickly add there are that um, you know when I've when I've had people come into my team to help teach like learning and development coaching stuff like um, sometimes I think as much as people want that type of attention it's perceived as kind of an interruption to like their normal work, right and it's like why do I need to do this I never have to convince anyone to show up for a video game. Um, it's what people do anyway when they want to blow off steam and they're working remotely. Um, the fact that I can turn that into an educational and training experience is what's powerful about this. Um, and the fact that people are not just showing up to learn, but to actually play and be with other people. And the fact that they hold on to those relationships afterward is what's so powerful. Elon, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, so I just wanted to talk that um, and say that within our corporate esports at Microsoft, um, how we really decide the games is that um, pretty much we've been organizing tournaments every season or every few months now. And every time we always just send out um, a survey. And I think it's like, it's expected that the most popular games will always be like League of Legends, Rocket League and all of that. So we do try to hold tournaments for those. Um, and every once in a while, we still try to hold like more casual games, such as Minecraft. Um, I think like my favorite part about like the Minecraft um, tournament is that it's actually like a build challenge. So the really important, the really fun thing about it is that I think they form like teams together and then they have around like a one or two hour build window where pretty much we give the participants a theme and then these participants have to work together and then create like a build um, that is related to that theme. Um, so actually we held an intern tournament around a month ago and it was really cute. The, the theme was Summer Cafe and it was really, it was really, really fun. And it was great to see like, um, these duos of like one intern and one FTE um, full-time employee really like play together um, and really try to like build something off the bat and these duos they never really like knew about each other and they just met each other for the tournament so it was really great to see all the creativity that came into it um, of just these two individuals that didn't really know together but they bond through like already trying to share because there's also you know that pressure about time so you really don't have time to like be shy about it. So you really get into it. Um, so yeah, I definitely think it's always great to have, you know, those staple games that a lot of people play, but is really high skill level of like League of Legends or Overwatch. But then you also try to include games that really don't need that much um, skill or at least like not that much knowledge to get started. Um, I think in the future, we would love to really organize something like Overcooked or something. So I think a balance between games that a lot of people play um, with high skill cap, but also include some games that people that don't really play a lot of video games can easily hop on. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll throw another mention out there for, I realize it's more of a beer and pretzels party game, uh, but on top of... Uh, Mario Party, Mario Kart, uh, Smash Brothers. I know where my game stands. I'm okay with that. Um, uh, the Another thing is uh, also uh, Jackbox games coming in for just random fun um, and learning a little bit about people as like a gateway of we're going to do a game night. And it, it, it can be a gateway into if you do have people that are reluctant to play uh, Overcooked or Among Us or those types of, again, Easier games, gateway type games, if you will, um, as a fellow addict, Elon. Um, you know, those are the types of games that you can also get out there. Um, as far as dejected feelings, uh, I think one of the biggest things that I heard is really um, is really about that diversity of games, uh, having different games at different levels and making sure that your communities uh, have a way of, of bringing in new people that aren't used to playing. Um, I would probably just add a little bit of rotation. You know, if somebody's like, oh, I want to play this, I want to play this, and you have enough people, you may want to just do that as a side thing or, you know, introduce it. I know, Elon, yours, your communities are a lot bigger and you have those rotations going on. So, you know, you can work those into rotations. Um, 
speaking of communities uh, and helping them, how do you make sure that people feel welcome into your communities? I know, uh, I know we all run these really large communities. So how do you, how do you make sure that people feel welcome, that they feel safe to be themselves as a gamer um, inside of those communities? Um, yeah. I, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, basically within our community, so for example, if you go into our Microsoft Gaming Discord, um, there are quite a few different chats. And actually, I think one of the most important things for such a big community and Discord server is you really need moderators. Um, I mean, to be fair, we never really have any instances where um, people go out of line, but I think definitely having moderators to really keep and to be there to monitor and really keep like everything um, really inclusive and um, let people really specify their opinions and, you know, say what they want to say. I think it's really important. Um, I think also in general, Microsoft from the ground up is really, really pushing for a very diverse and inclusive culture, which I think has been working um, really well. Um, but really to get people included, we always try to organize a lot of events. Um, sometimes it's just like, you know, networking events where, you know, people, speakers, um, our employees are really um, like seniors or like principal engineers. And they really try to, you know, let people know, um, try like give them tips on how to like go up the ladder, for example, or, you know, really on a more like personal basis, we have like a, a Microsoft only um, chat where people really talk inside of it. Um, and it because it's in Discord, it's a lot more casual. And I've seen a lot of instances where people who just started at the company, they feel super comfortable just, you know, reaching out to someone that is, you know, supposedly a senior um, engineer. But because it's a very casual setting, people feel very, very safe and very, um, okay with talking and asking them questions like oh like I don't know how to like what should I do is this like a situation where I'm supposed to speak up or for example it's really a good space for people to feel like they're safe to ask questions that I think maybe in the context of a work environment might not feel as inviting so I've seen a lot of that and we're we're definitely trying to give a lot of spaces um, for people to feel comfortable talking and Hopefully, I think it's working, and I think in the future, we'll definitely try to add more opportunities for people to network, maybe a mentorship program, but yeah. Uh, I'd love to double click on something that Elon said, which is that it, it's, it's uh, and it relates to this question that's been asked in the chat about is there a demographic of players in gaming sessions that are interested to play, uh, like social family responsibilities and stuff like that. I think it's a really important question and it relates to what Elon's saying in that we, in order to be able to play games, we have to develop tools to be able to communicate with one another. Um, really experienced gamers are very emotionally intelligent in most cases um, because they have to be. Um, but also in terms of safety to play, um, and if you look at the panel we have today, like, you know, none of us fit the stereotype, maybe I do, uh, but none of us fit the stereotype of who a gamer is supposed to be. Um, and that's because I'm not sure that that stereotype really exists in the gaming communities I'm a part of. Um, I, on my team, I have kids. Um, our top player has a kid and plays uh, with his partner. Um, and we can hear their baby in the background when they're playing. Um, and, uh, you know, I actually teach my daughter about life through Overwatch. Um, and I can understand Minecraft and all of the weirdness of that because I have my own games that I play. So it really becomes an intergenerational conversation and it becomes a conversation across demographics. Um, the Overwatch League at Amazon is the only chance I have to interact with people who work in fulfillment centers, uh, period. And I have really good friends now who work in fulfillment centers who, um, are interested in expanding their careers, getting into software engineering or whatever, partially because of their exposure to us. Um, and then likewise, as a you know member of the company, as someone who's senior in the company, I have very clear read into what their lives are like. Um, 
and clear empathy in terms of what their lives are like. And it changes and transforms me, but I work with them. Um, so I feel like there's a strong leveling effect that gaming has that's different from some of the things that we've done in the past. Um, the last point I'll make is that, you know, this isn't a new thing. In the old days, companies had things like softball teams and golf outings and charity golf tournaments and stuff like that. No criticism there. That may have worked for a previous generation. But when you're talking about a softball league, we're talking about golf club, you're talking about a very, you know, masculine, heteronormative, and frankly, very kind of Caucasian experience in a lot of cases. It's not something that appeals to most people. And the lack of participation on their part may feel as if they can't really participate in the culture of senior leadership in the companies or meet executives or things like that. Video games are accessible to everybody with a PC, which we all have at work because we have to. You don't have to buy golf clubs. You don't have to dress a certain way or be a certain way to be accepted. You simply have to show up and play. We're all just digital avatars on the screen anyway without ethnicity or uh, gender or sexuality. So there's a strong, powerful thing that happens when we build these communities and bring people together. And uh, just from a, there is a stereotype of gamers that exist outside of the gaming community. Um, inside of healthy gaming communities, they all, every study that's ever looked at gamers across a large board always looks like the population. So if you have a population that's 50% male, 50% female, guess what? 50% of, of your gamers are going to be male and 50% of your gamers are going to be female. Um, that's one of, I, at least from my viewpoint, it's one of those things that you look at for a healthy community. Um, Michael, I saw that you had your hand raised. Did you have? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd like to offer, you know, thinking about your question, the ways in which we can make people feel welcome. Um, we, we, we're, we're here in a crowd of folks who are all, you know, gamers most of our life or game friendly or pro game. Um, but the reality is this notion of gaming in a professional context outside of the esports industry is pretty disruptive. And part of the journey I've experienced, I'm sure many others here have experienced it, is as we go forward in representing gaming, there's a certain responsibility we have as trailblazers, right? We're ambassadors to the, the rest of the world, at least in our various ecosystems around what a gamer is and how gamers fuse their personal um, identity as a gamer with their professional persona. And so one of the steps that I've taken in my community, which has helped, <clears throat> helped newcomers feel welcome no matter what their life circumstance, is to try to instill that intentionally as a community culture. That for everyone who aspires to any any level of leadership, and in our in our organization, someone simply volunteers and does the work, and that makes them a leader. But the the meeting I have with them is I instill to them that responsibility of being a a good ambassador, and and I find that to be pretty critical because even some of the the most productive, most diligent members of our community when they first started were a little rough around the edges. That's something I find so unique about this community. You know, we've talked about the stress of gaming and how you've got the shadow personality, which I, I love now having a word for it. Many folks don't know how to reflect on that. And I've had so many powerful moments, especially with new members, new leaders, where, you know, I end up having a one on one with them where I kind of explore what is their personality under pressure. And I kind of invite them to consider whether that's how they want to present themselves in this social context that includes other people, other professionals. And to date, for the handful of times I've had that conversation, the response has only ever been so positive. And I find that if you take that step, if you're, if you're intentional and you have someone being accountable for these communities where folks take the step to reach out to folks who might be exhibiting otherwise unwelcome behaviors, folks are really open to that feedback. And, and I've had instances where folks who at first were pretty spiky personalities turn around and become some of our most charismatic, most resilient leaders. And for this gaming communities that we run, I, I feel that's kind of essential because you got to meet people where they're at. You got to, through the context of the community, give them an opportunity to level up and grow into the professional that they, that they can and the player that they want to be. So to me, having a personal touch goes a long way. And I know at scale, we can't do it ourselves, but that's why I rely on the different community leads, different you know, leaders within different parts of the community to just take that step and have those heart to hearts. And, and to date, I think we haven't had any incidences that I've known of of anyone misrepresenting the company. And internally, we even have a, 
some of the best reputation for representing the company very well, while at the same time being a modern disruptive representation of our brand, which to me is, is music to my ears and a showcase of the effectiveness of the approach. Yep. And one of the things that I've heard you say a couple of times, not necessarily here, but in previous conversations, Michael, is, is about being that responsible disruptor, right? Sometimes you have to help help bring people along to become leaders in a specific thing. They might be amazing moderators on a Discord, but they may not be the people to propose something new in front of, uh, in front of CEOs, right? Two different skill sets, two different things, but without those two different leadership styles, uh, we wouldn't be successful as a group, right? So, um, yep. I, do you have anything else to add on the responsible disruptor? Uh, you know, how do we make sure that we're growing the types of leaders? What do you look for in responsible disruptor leadership? Right. So, so the the primary thing that I look for um, whenever I'm I'm creating teams is folks who are impact and results driven, more so than um, ambition driven. You'll find when folks are are impact driven, they will do such amazing things. And and as most of us know, you know the 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 success comes with it. And I find in this space, as you start to get into modern leadership circles, you see all kind of different different types of folks. So that's the thing I I put first and foremost in all my leaders. Uh, the second thing that I really instill is a respect and appreciation for the status quo. I know there's a tendency when you've got great ideas and you're sharp enough to pull off a prototype in a weekend. We're quick to just say, throw out the old, here's the new, we're ready to rock, we've got it figured out. But through our experience, if you take the time to understand why things are the way they are and to have meaningful collaborative dialogue with the folks who got us there, um, you'll usually end up in a much better place. I mean, I was proud through the discussions with our corporate legal brand strategy teams. We were able to, at IBM, come up with a set of guidelines governing a corporate esports team. And so it went from, well, we're not sure we're comfortable to we're comfortable, we're excited, and you've helped us create policies that provide protection and guidance to folks. And, and so no matter what kind of experience you're pursuing crazy idea, take the time to talk to the folks who, you know, establish the, the lay of the land today. And I guarantee you'll end up in a pl better place with their guidance, with their coaching, and, and your community will be, a, will be better for it. Yep. And, uh, and I'll, add a, I'll add a plus one in there for helping to build policies for companies I never thought would have esports policies. Like it's, uh, it's, a, it's a weird and fantastic thing. Uh, so we have uh, so we have five minutes less left. Um, Nil, do you have uh, just a, a one or two minute about measuring? You know, as we're making shifts, as we're making changes, about measuring measuring leadership. How do we look at that? And I know uh, earlier you mentioned Comprehend and to answer that question out loud. Comprehend is available to CEA customers if you're interested in it. Um, reach out to Brad. It is a fantastic and beautiful tool. Um, but yeah, so Neil, anyways, I, yeah, I'll, so I'll get off the advertising train and back to no, Neil. Totally you anything? So I should, I should confess that from Joshua's point of view, I did not make up any of that, uh, comprehend stuff myself. It's a tool that Brad's company has, the CA has, I didn't write it. I'm just the customer of it. And I think it's awesome. Um, and it's helped me with my team, um, in terms of, um, uh, uh, kind of closing thoughts, um, Say. Sorry, Joshua. One, uh, repeat the last question again. Sorry, brain, total brain. Uh, measuring, uh, measuring leadership. Measuring How do you know that it's right, being, yeah. 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 So um, right now in organizations, what we have is talent review. And we look at different data or parameters or things that tell us whether this person will be a good future leader and how we cultivate them. And the, the process is unfortunately very problematic um, in the sense that it does things like prioritize mostly visible people or whatever. There aren't really hard measurements around impact and it becomes a conversation about people who we like, maybe because they remind us of ourselves, maybe because they remind us of our own experience. What we don't have is an objective voice in the room to actually look at how this person is progressing in the way that they should progress for the type of person they are. What I think gaming's given me is a vocabulary when I look at my team to understand that like some people on my team are going to be people who score big plays and that's what their role is right some people set up the play right some people take care of the team or play defense for the team 
And because I know that about them, because I've gamed with them, I can understand how to build their career accordingly. Whether that means pivoting from one type of role to another to get them promoted, or whether that means emphasizing what they bring to the table when I do talent review and being able to say that over four or five games with them, I have actually seen how they communicate and I've seen the results of that in their actual work, right? That's powerful. And I know of nothing else that actually does that. Awesome. All right, Michael, 60 seconds. Any final closing words? Yeah, I'd say there's no better time than now to be a gamer in whether you're working for a company or whether you're still in college or whether you're just in the free market. Through communities like ours, initiatives like this and others, um, there's amazing opportunity to make gaming and, and the society a better place. Um, my favorite story is how interns, when they find out about our community, raise their hand and say, I'm big into fighting games. I want to start something. And just this summer, we had an intern take that initiative. So if you're a gamer and you're passionate tuning into this or here live, reach out, let me know, let us know what you're excited about and we'll figure out how to get you engaged because we need people like you to show the world how gaming can make the world a better place and to help respective companies do cool things. Awesome, thanks. And Elon, close it out for us. Yeah, so yeah, first of all, I just wanted to thank, uh, thank you so much for giving me a platform to really share experiences and yeah, um, so one important, one really fun fact that I really realized is that um, gaming is such, is such an important part of people's lives now. And I think like it's about time that like companies really start to like leverage this passion that people have for video games. Um, surprisingly, there are, I learned that there are actually a lot of interns that when they learn that, you know, Microsoft, for example, has like really, really good, strong teams. Um, in the Corporate Esports Association, it actually becomes a factor in their decisions. And I think it's never too late. I think it's actually really time for companies to really start leveraging this passion that people have for gaming. And, you know, like for all the, the interns or the people that are really looking to join companies, I think it's really not even a big stretch to really include gaming now into your CVs to really show um, all the different skills that you have learned through gaming. And yeah, hopefully as things um, really get better for gaming and as it becomes a lot more inclusive, I think, I think gaming in the future is really going to be a big powerhouse for companies to really recruit. So as a closing statement, I'd just really like to say that like gaming is awesome, period. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for everybody who was able to uh, attend and uh, join us. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, as Ethel said, uh, game on and uh, be safe out there, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.